Um, I asked a couple of our gentlemen to hand out Bible study handouts, as always, and I'm crunching as much as I can in a one sheet of paper, and I, I felt like, oh, man, there was so much material. I thought, should I go to two sheets of paper? But I didn't. But uh, the topic I'm going to make into two parts. This is part one of two. As you see on your handout, it's called The Times of the Gentiles. Part two, more than likely next month, since I've already prepared it, will be on the rise of the, uh, the beast power, uh, the king of the north, um, the, the, uh, the Gentile rulership to come at the end of the age. That'll be the next Bible study. But this one kind of precedes it. And when I was at Ambassador College back in the 70s, Prophecy was an entire, uh, Bible prophecy was an entire semester class. And so another full semester class was called United States and Britain in Prophecy from the Worldwide Church of God booklet at the time. And they were absolutely fascinating classes, entire semesters. I'm not going to try to condense all that information into two 35-minute Bible studies, but I tried to put in the pertinent parts, and I, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, so looking at your handout, the introduction we both have, it says Jesus told his disciples that just before his return, the world would be dominated by Gentile nations. What is the cause? What will be the result of their influence? And how will that affect the United States and British Commonwealth nations? I hope to answer those questions in this, again, 35-minute Bible study. So. The next thing in your handout is the, just a reference scripture, Luke 21, verses 7 through 17, just a summary of it. Jesus answered his disciples when they asked. This is the parallel scripture to Matthew 24, where he talks about the disciples say, what will be the signs of your coming and of the end of the age? So this is parallel to that. He's answering them about conditions around the world before his return. He described increasing religious deception, natural disasters, disease and pestilence, religious persecution, revolutions and wars. In other words, troubling times for the entire world before his return. Then he went on to zero in on, and focus on Jerusalem. What would be, befall Jerusalem and the people of Judah, meaning essentially the Jews and descendants of Benjamin and Levi that would make up a dominant number of people in that little tiny nation state of modern day Israel. And so he talks about them being surrounded by armies. Let's read verse 20 together in your handout. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Verses 23 and 24. Here, Jesus Christ, again, speaks about those just at this time that are in Judea, including in Jerusalem, that they will be defeated by the Gentiles. And once again, Judea is essentially made up of the descendants of Judah and Levi and Benjamin, which are three of the 12 sons of Jacob. Now, here in the United States, we actually have a larger population of descendants of Judah than that little tiny section of land in Palestine. We have more here, but he's talking to the disciples about what's gonna happen there in Jerusalem because it's a hot spot of end time prophecy. And he says, for there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. Again, people of Judah and or Judea, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations and Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles is fulfilled. Now, this is not the first place in the Bible where times of the Gentiles is mentioned, but the prophesied times of the Gentiles Jesus Christ is referring to will affect modern day descendants of Israel. And when we say modern day descendants of Israel, Israel of the Bible includes those that migrated mostly into Northwest European countries after the fall of the northern nation of ancient Israel, when the Assyrians took them into captivity, 722, 721 BC, 
many of them migrated northward into the Scandinavian countries, the British Isles. And so they would be essentially the English-speaking peoples. British Commonwealth nations, United States, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and to some degree South Africa. And so there are other Israelitish nations as well that don't speak English, obviously. There you have Luxembourg and Sweden and Denmark and Norway, and you have um, the other uh, nations in Northwest Europe. But a vital key in understanding Bible prophecy is the identity of both ancient and modern day Israel. And the relationship God has with these peoples we're talking about. I mentioned this in numerous times, and I, it just it blows me away sometimes to think about how much this great nation, you know that we are the third most populous nation on earth after China and then Indonesia and the United States, 330 million people. This country doesn't know it's Israel, does not know it's Israel. It's my own personal feeling that this country really has to know these things before a full testimony of what God is planning to bring about. That's just my, my opinion based on Bible history, that God does nothing except that he first tells his servants the prophets. And we don't have a modern day prophet that we know of. We don't know of one, but can God cause one? Well, we know that in the end time, Malachi speaks of an Elijah yet to come. And that's different, a different personality, we believe, than the two witnesses. That's different. We don't know when, we don't know God's timeline on that, but I, I pray that God will bring somebody that will at least be a witness to the American and British Isles peoples before, um, you know, before worse things happen. We'll see. We'll see what God has in store. But first, who are the Gentiles? Let's talk about that for a moment. In your notes, the Merriam-Webster.com Bible explains that the English word Gentile comes from the Latin word gentilis, uh, Jerome, Jerome's Latin Vulgate translation of the Bible in the fourth century translated the Hebrew word goyim into gentilis. Now, when you talk to Jews, they will use the word goyim as anyone who's not of the tribe of Judah. See, they think that United States and British Commonwealth peoples are gent essentially Gentiles. They, that's what they believe. They don't know that we're also Israel. Just because of the 10 lost tribes of Israel that were scattered and history lost track of them, the Jews in general don't think that they're uh, around anymore. They don't think that they're in God's purview anymore, those other 10 tribes. Once again, most of Judah today is a combination of the uh, uh, descendants of Judah and Benjamin and Levi. Let's keep in mind that Levi was the priestly tribe that was scattered among all of the 12 tribes, and so was Simeon. Simeon was another son that was scattered among all the 12 tribes of Israel too. They didn't own their own landmass like the other 10 did. Anyway, so a little, little background on that. So Gentiles are any other peoples of the earth other than Israelites or descendants of Israel. So it refers to the rest of the world who are non-Israelite, or uh, in, which includes non-Jewish. It just includes that. In the New Testament, the Greek equivalent is ethnos, which also is translated Gentiles in the New Testament. So goyim is the same thing as all other nations on earth that did not descend from the 12 sons of Jacob. And ethnos, same thing in the New Testament. So in physical terms only, physical terms, the Gentiles are all peoples of earth who are not descendants of Jacob. Jacob's name, remember, was changed to Israel, Genesis 32. And now there's a different category altogether of Gentiles who are called, converted, and have God's Holy Spirit. They are grafted into spiritual Israel, but that's a different topic altogether. Different topic. We're talking physical terms here. Birthright promise delayed. Let me give you a tiny comment on that. Abraham's descendants were destined to become great. God wanted to give them vast wealth and influence 
over the nations surrounding them. Palestine, well, where ancient Israel and modern day Israel are today, is surrounded by three continents. A great place for God to place them to be a positive influence on vast numbers of people. The known world, even in Paul's day, he would talk about the whole world. That was the known world in that part, which include Europe, and included Asia and the Middle East and the Far East, and included the African continent. And so ancient Israel was in a perfect position to be a light and a beacon to other nations, and they failed. God is not finished with that task for them. They will pick up when Christ returns to have that role reinstated to them. That is still a role for ancient Israel, I'm sorry, the Israel to come. And so when God made a covenant with ancient Israel at Mount Sinai, they agreed to it. And if they obeyed him, God would make them tremendously great in many ways. But because they repeatedly broke covenant with God over and over and over again, finally and eventually the northern tribes, the ten tribes of Israel, went into Assyrian captivity. And so God delayed those blessings he wanted to give them at that time. And they were again scattered in mostly into northwest Europe. They seemed to dis disappear from the landscape, from history books. But God has always had his eyes on them. Here's a, here's a passage in your notes, Amos 9 verse 9. Amos 9 verse 9 says, uh, well, it says, God said after scattering them, he would watch over them and preserve a faithful remnant among them. It says, for surely I will command and will sift the house of Israel among all nations as grain is sifted in a sieve and yet not the smallest grain will fall from the ground. God has been watching the descendants of Israel for these past 2,500 years. Then Isaiah 49, verses 12, uh, verse 12 and Jeremiah 31, verse 10, they tell us the Israelites migrated into the northwest, into the isles afar off, uh, a term used for other nations far away. Promises to Abraham passed down through Joseph's sons. First, Abraham was given all these uh, staged prophecies of greatness and you, your descendants like the sand on the seashore and kings would come from you and, uh, and your wife Sarah and that even Ishmael, kings would come from Ishmael, but Jacob would receive the primary blessings. And then God would bless Jacob and tell him these, these prophecies. And then they would go on to Joseph. And not only Joseph, but Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. So Genesis 49, verse 19 says, He, Manasseh, shall also become a people, and he also shall be great. Now Manasseh was the uh, firstborn, but... Joseph was trying to stop Jacob from crossing the hands, laying hands on the heads of Ephraim and Manasseh. And Joseph says, no, no, Father, you got that wrong. No, he says, no, God has shown me this, that I'm supposed to bless this one before this one, and that Ephraim would become a multitude of nations, and that um, Manasseh would become a great single nation. So here it says, but truly his younger brother Ephraim shall be greater than he, and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. Well, this was rising to its peak in the 1800s for the British Commonwealth nations. Ephraim was not a single nation, but would become a people in multiple nations. We've heard the phrase many years that the uh, sun never sets on the British Empire, and that was true, especially in the 1800s, when all around the world there were, um, there were these nations that uh, God allowed Ephraim, or the British peoples, to colonize and to bring law and order to many of these countries and to bring their blessings as well. Genesis 49 verse 1 provides an important key to the fulfillment of these blessings that they would come about in the last days. 
in the last days. Verse 1, let's read together. And Jacob called his sons and said, now this is when he called his 12 sons together. Gather together that I may tell you what may befall you in the last days. And then a little further down, as we saw in verse 19, he gets to Ephraim and Manasseh, Joseph's sons. And he says, I will put Israel, now Jacob is Israel now, that's his name. I will put my name on your two sons, Joseph. And so they had the blessings handed off to them that God had promised to Abraham. They went through Ephraim and Manasseh, the sons of Joseph. And so uh, we're told in verses 23 and 24 that God would be with them and they would inherit great natural resources, among other things, verses 25 and 26. So from the time period, and I'm going to give you three or four examples here, in the last days, now that is such a fluid trying to pinpoint that. In the Church of God, we've been prophesying, you, you know, Mr. Herbert Armstrong began about 80 years ago prophesying what's going to happen to Israel, what's going to, Germany will rise again, some of the major things, what will happen to Jerusalem before Christ returns. And that was the last days, but in this bigger context, the last days includes the last couple hundred or 250 years, 250 years. Here are a couple of examples um, showing that the Israelitish peoples would become the dominant influencers since right around 1800 or a little before 1800. It was 1798 when Britain's Admiral Horatio Nelson pursued Napoleon's fleet. You remember, Napoleon was the dictator of France, and he wanted to, uh, uh, while he was overseeing the rise of a, um, a Europe that was a world global power at the time, so he pursues Napoleon's fleet to Aboukir Bay, Egypt, and then he destroys most of the fleet in the famous Battle of the Nile. Overnight, the Mediterranean became an English sea. Suddenly, England op opened up and owned the Mediterranean, pretty much. Thus, unquestioned naval supremacy fell to the British, enabling modern Ephraim, Ephraim to become the prophesied company of nations scattered all across the globe. And that's just one example. Another one, 1783. The United States colonies, little tiny colonies, won the War of Independence after seven years of war with England. We declared independence in 1776, but that war waged till 1783, finally with the British surrendering. For four years, the United States, or four years later, the United States Constitution was signed, and so was prophesied the single major power of Manasseh being the United States. In 1803, just adding to the United States' power and influence, 1803, the United States acquires the Louisiana Purchase from Napoleon. He's desperate for cash for his war efforts, and it nearly doubled the size of this country. Britain's empire suddenly spread around the globe, and from the eight, late 18, uh, 1700s, first the British Empire, and then the United States became the dominant influencers of the world. Fascinating, though, when you look at all of human history, 6,000 years, from the time of the building of the Tower of Babel, let's say, or Noah, and on through till Christ returns, there's a little blip that we have been blessed to live in, about 250-year period, which we could call the times of the Israelites. All the rest of human history, we would call the times of the Gentiles. This little period of time that we, again, have been recipients of the greatest blessings on earth is about a 250-year period leading up to, well, we're still enjoying the, um, as Mr. Joel Meeker says, we're still coasting on blessings in this country. And in a recent sermon that we showed here, we're still coasting on God's blessings at this time. So we're seeing 
a close of the times of the Israelites, and I'm using that term on my own because the rest of human history is pretty much dominated by the great powers of Babylon, Medo-Persia, the Greco-Macedonian Empire, and the Roman Empire, the four great powers that came from the time that Daniel received prophecies in the court of Nebuchadnezzar forward. Those are all times of Gentiles. We could say, once again, we've been living in the times of the Israelites. Now, God's warning to Israel. It says in your notes, Israel, keeping God's laws is a condition. Going backwards, the promises to Abraham were unconditional. That's why this nation and British Commonwealth nations are clueless about why they have been blessed so much in the last 250 years, except for a few people that are understanding and that have been given the blessing of understanding their Bibles. But they don't know why they're blessed so much, but it's because God said these are unconditional. But now we get to our modern age, God has fulfilled his blessings on Abraham, and what is making them conditional is how much do the English-speaking peoples know about their Bibles? There are more Bibles produced in the, in the United States than any other nation on earth. Uh, well, it's kind of funny. China is printing more Bibles than anyone else, but they don't keep them. They, they send them out to the rest of the world. China prints a whole lot of Bibles to go to other places. What I'm saying here is we, as a nation and as a British Commonwealth group of nations should know better. We have had our earliest colleges and universities in the, in the early years of this country were all Bible seminary colleges. We taught the Bible, uh, yes, with errors, of course, in the ma major Protestant uh, universities and churches, but we have been losing this at a rapid pace, such a rapid pace, people are rejecting God and failing to teach their children what their grandparents learned over the years and great-grandparents. So what we're seeing is God has already fulfilled what he promised to Abraham through Ephraim and Manasseh. It says in Deuteronomy 10, verses 1 through 14 in your notes, God explained his principles of what would produce blessings and what would produce curses. Verses 12 and 13. And now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. They agreed to that. This was part of the covenant at Mount Sinai. Yes, we will keep all these statutes and decrees and commandments. They failed. They didn't keep them for very long, and there were upstarts, and there were revivals, and there were terrible times where God had to strip away blessings and send enemies into their territory and strip them of land and property and food, and, and, uh, and then eventually, again, the northern tribe of Israel went into captivity, never returned. They lost their language. They lost their uh, identity, their ethnicity. They lost all those things. And they went into scattered nations. Judah to the south, about 135 years later, they also went into captivity under Babylon. But a lot of them returned. Well, I say a lot, a remnant, a small number actually returned out of Babylon. And they did not lose their language, their religion, their ethnicity. They held on to it. The Jews know who they are. But the rest of Israel, they know not who they are. So this coming times of the Gentiles, again, Jesus spoke about, is going to impact the modern descendants of Israel. Deuteronomy 28, verse 15 in your notes, God reveals that ignoring and breaking these laws would cause automatic penalties and curses that would increase ex uh, incrementally. Oh yes, exponentially too. Seven times more, seven times more, seven times more in another scripture. But if God doesn't see a turnaround, doesn't see repentance, doesn't see an awakening of why are all these troubles and crises and horrible weather conditions and food shortages and famines and, and other 
nations pressuring and saying, we're, we're going to launch nuclear weapons at you and things like that. Why don't we see that? Well, God is trying to get the attention of these Israelitish nations. He's trying hard to get their attention right now. Verses 47 through 50 in your notes, because you, Israel, did not serve the Lord your God with joy and with gladness of heart. For the abundance of everything, therefore you shall serve your enemies, whom the Lord will send up against you in hunger and thirst and nakedness and in need of everything. And he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. The Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flies, a nation whose language you do not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which does not respect the elderly, nor show favor to the young. It's a horrible indictment. It's a horrible thing to warn Israel about. That's why I feel so strongly that God somehow needs to get that message across in a bigger way. We are certainly preaching prophecy, and so are the other Church of God groups. But how much is the nation listening? You know, little by little, they are, but is there something bigger to come? We will see. We will see. Amos 5, verses 13 and 14. Amos, in a call for Israel to repent what is coming, he says this, Therefore the prudent keep silent at this time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. So the Lord God of hosts will be with you. There comes a point when God starts talking to his faithful ones that they go into hiding when there is wicked leadership and that there is a time coming when there is a shutdown of the preaching of the gospel, the famine of the word. There's a time coming where God will continue to watch over his church and guide them. And we'll talk more about that in the next Bible study. Ezekiel 7 verse 7. God says he'll send the worst of the Gentiles to punish the people of Israel at this coming time. And so you think about the mentality of terrorists you've seen in news reports of the Taliban, Taliban and Hezbollah, Al-Qaeda, uh, ISIS did some horrible things when they were rising to power before they were um, reduced in their influence in Africa. Al-Shabaab and Boko Haram are two prominent terrorist groups. It's only a small foretaste of prophecies to be fulfilled in the times to come. Ezekiel 30, verse 3, of the last days, it will be day, a day of clouds, he says, a time of the Gentiles. Matthew 24, verse 21, Jesus said it will be the worst time in human history. Just a, a taste of some of the prophecies of what's ahead. Now, God does not desire to bring tr curses. This is a, a headliner in your notes. But he knows the proclivities and the patterns of Israel. He knows their stiff neck patterns over history. Bible prophecies show it will be Gentile nations that will subdue modern Israel and will rule the world with a different set of laws than what we're used to. And again, they come in increasing stages, but this is what God told Israel. Second Chronicles 7, verse 14. And it's just as true today. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and heal their land. That's a two-part promise forgive their sin nationally, and heal their land, bring them prosperity again, and bring back the rain in due season, and the gentle seasons, and to uh, give them the influence over their enemies once again. So this is just as true today as it was when Solomon said this prayer at the inauguration of Solomon's temple. Joel 2 verse 12 in your notes, now therefore says the Lord eternal, Turn to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping, and with mourning. So, in that way, rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. It is not God's desire to bring punishment on Israel. It's not his desire at all. 
there was a very common demonstration of humility that oftentimes was just abused uh, when kings and other people would tear their garments when they were uh, in shock of something or disturbed or being humiliated. Um, but it is something where God says, no, I'm looking on the heart. I want to see what's in your heart as a nation. He really wants to see a turnaround. Here are four things to watch. Number one in your notes, Daniel 11, verse 40, tells us that the king of the south, most likely a Muslim power or federation of Muslim states. Now, for centuries, Muslim countries have been so fragmented, they have not been able to unify for very long, for very much. That could change. That could change for a short period of time. But the king of the south looks like a Muslim power in the Middle East that will attack the king of the north. We understand that to be a power centered in Europe. North of the Middle East is Europe, also called the beast. And the beast will send its armies down near Jerusalem and defeat the king of the south. I'm summarizing much more detail. Verses 42, 40 to 42. At that time, the king of the south will attack him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, with many ships. He shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. He shall also enter the glorious land. We're talking about Jerusalem here. And many countries will be overthrown, except some will escape his hand, Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Am Ammon, or Ammon. Uh, Ammon, Jordan would be what we understand to be this, this area that is going to be somewhat insulated or very insulated from what the king of the north plans to do. And the king of the north will stretch out his hand against the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. That's number one to watch. Number two to watch, Jerusalem will be in the middle of all this conflict, right in the center of it all, between these two powers, the king of the south, king of the north, What's in the middle? Jerusalem. And so Revelation 11, verses 1 and 2, Jerusalem has been given to the Gentiles. They will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. That's 1,260 days based on prophetic year of 360 days. That's a prophetic year in the Bible, not 365 and a quarter, but 360. 1,260 days. Number three, after appearing to support the Jewish people, in allowing them to reinstate animal sacrifices right now that can't take place with, uh, uh, because the Temple Mount is actually controlled by the Palestinians, the Arabs, and not by the Jews. Uh, although the Jews are the Orthodox and the, um, the very um, strict Jews are, are constantly trying to see a, a way to get around that, to establish some kind of an altar or to start up animal sacrifice. Once in a while, you'll hear of some skirmish over there where someone uh, radicalized will try to do this, and they're, they're, they're pulled away, they're shut down, or they're, they're just eliminated suddenly from doing that. Something will change. An influencer will change this and allow this to take place for a while. Daniel 9, verse 27, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Now, a week in prophecy could be a seven-year period. Jesus Christ was crucified in the midst of a week. That's dual. He was actually crucified on a Wednesday in the middle of a physical seven-day week, but also in the middle of a seven-year period in which he was uh, preaching. Three and a half years into it, he was crucified. So it could be uh, middle of the week, could be three and a half years into it, it shall bring an end to the sacrifice and offering. Daniel eleven thirty one, And forces shall be mustered by him, king of the north, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress. Then they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation. Different interpretations for that. One is that whoever is in charge or in power in that area will set up some other kind of a pagan symbol uh, it can have um, literal and also figurative meaning here, though. Something is going to take the place. Uh, Antiochus Epiphanes was a ruler who put in a, a Greek pagan uh, statue in the temple of God, and 
sacrificed the Jews on the, that pagan temple at the time and mingled their blood in, 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 the, in the temple. So it could be literal. Number four, in the place of the daily sacrifices, this beast power will erect an idol. Okay, we just talked about that. Luke 21, verse 20. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, you know that its desolation is near. He tells them, leave, get out. Those with the ear to hear and the senses to understand what's coming, get out of that part of the world. Get out of Jerusalem and Judea. Daniel 12, verse 11. And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. This abomination of desolation is being understood as being an army occupying Jerusalem and as an image put in place instead of the Jews allowing for, for their daily sacrifices. And so we'll see how all this comes about, but those are just four things to watch uh, in history. And none of this is new. None of this is something we've taught differently in the last 80 years, really. The, the times of the Gentiles will come to an abrupt end after 42 months of global power. Very short-lived power, but it will influence the entire world. It's called the beast. It will have a false religious system that will work together. Um, I mentioned that this is, there's more on this on the next Bible study. Revelation 19, verse 20, jumping down a little bit. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in, the, in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of burning, uh, fire burning uh, with brimstone. So we can see that they're captured alive. They will go into a lake of fire. Uh, which is for them the first death anyway, first death. Revelation 20, verse 1, then Satan and his demons will be bound and put away in the bottomless pit um, for a thousand years. And so it says here in your notes, when the seventh angel blows his trumpet, there'll be loud voices in heaven saying, Revelation 11, verse 15, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. There will be rejoicing in heaven and rejoicing on earth that this short-lived period of 42 months of the last time, the times of the Gentiles, uh, comes into power will be over and will come to a sudden end. Now, in Bible prophecy, we have in many cases been very accurate about what happens, it's just the timing has not always been there. We see things that um, we always, well, we didn't always know what timing, I was looking at some of Mr. Herbert Armstrong's, um, they, were, uh, they were reprint articles, they were articles in 1952, and 1960, and so forth, and they, uh, they were very, um, shall we say aggressive on not exactly setting dates, but I mean looking at the timing of events as being very imminent. Well, we know that God has his own timetable. Um, some part of prophecy serves to help us to understand what's coming. Another part of prophecy helps us to see what just happened. It's something for us to always realize that when we can look back at the fulfillment of prophecy, we can see that's what God was talking about. And now we see we're a little closer where we are on the timetable. That's what God was talking about. Uh, jumping down to a conclusion here. At Christ's return, again, the times of the Gentiles, that 42-month period is going to come to an abrupt, abrupt end. Jesus Christ will defeat all nations who stand up and come to rally against him. We're told in the Bible, all nations will gather together near Jerusalem in the plain of Megiddo and that God draws them together and then he puts a sudden end to the conflict and uh, they, come, they come to fight Jesus Christ and his angelic host that come at his return. And from then on, Jesus Christ is the sovereign King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 
The end time dominance of the Gentile nations will be under Satan's influence though, and again will bring unimaginable suffering and death upon mankind. Fortunately, once again, just a three and a half year period, and Jesus Christ will end that misery. Luke 21, verse 34, it's not in your notes. It's uh, off the page. <laughs> Luke 21, verse 34, a very well-known passage after giving his disciples this summary of the end time events, and he introduces the times of the Gentiles that Ezekiel talked about. He says, but take heed to yourselves. Test your hearts, lest your hearts be weighed down by carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life. And that day, the day of God, the time of God's vengeance, the seventh uh, trumpet blast of revelation, that day come upon you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the earth. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape these things which shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So once again, next time, we'll go more in depth, but we'll also see what God has in store for protecting his faithful people in the greatest time of crisis to come upon the whole earth. With that, I will ask our song leader, Mr. Bruce Rivers, to uh, lead us in a hymn, and then we'll do announcements, or two hymns, and then announcements. Well, thank you, Mr. Mullen. It is time to begin our regular